Hello, Vision Nation. Have you ever wondered how a guy with only an eighth grade education could become one of the richest people in the world? Well, hold on to your hats, folks, because in this episode, we're about to dive into Kirk Kerkorian's story. This guy went from dropping out of junior high to being a boxer, then a pilot, and finally conquering the business world. And let me tell you, his business accomplishments are impressive enough. The real kicker is that he built the world's largest casino hotel not once, not twice, but three times. Now I know what you're thinking. How is that even possible for a guy that didn't finish high school? Well, my friends, that's exactly what we're gonna uncover. And a quick note, I've adjusted all the dollar figures in this story to today's dollars so that it's easier to follow. Also, if you're new to the show, this is where we uncover true stories of people making millions. We discuss the real case studies and strategies that people use to get wealthy. So hit that like and subscribe button because you're a true champion and you don't want to miss out on this wild ride. All right, let's get into it. So Kirk's parents were tough as nails. They had to escape Turkey during the Armenian genocide by hitching a ride on a cattle boat. It was their ticket to save their lives. They finally settled in the US of A and started a family. Kirk was the baby of the family, born in sunny California in 1917. You'd think that being born in Cali would mean a life of luxury, but their life was far from comfortable. At the ripe old age of four, Kirk's old man decided to buy some farms with all the family's money, and he even took on a whack load of debts. Within a few years, they owned 10 farms. Sounds like a sweet deal, right? Wrong. Because they had all this land, they also had a ton of loans to pay back. And then, bam, the 1920s recession hit and they couldn't pay the mortgages. The family was broke and the dad even tried to put one of the properties in Kirk's name to save it from being repossessed by the creditors. Now that's a rough situation, folks. So what did they do? Well, they packed up their bags and moved to LA, hoping for a fresh start. But let me tell you, city life wasn't much easier. They couldn't even pay their rent and had to move every few months. Kirk's early years were like a boot camp for life. Even at the tender age of nine, Kirk was out there selling newspapers and taking on odd jobs to help his family make ends meet. He didn't keep a penny for himself either. No, sir. He handed over every dime to his parents to help with rent and food. Of course, when you're constantly moving from place to place and you're a poor immigrant family, it's not the most stable environment. So Kirk ended up at this disciplinary school because he caused so much trouble. Now, this disciplinary school was no joke. I'm talking about teachers who thought it was okay to use a metal studded leather belt to punish kids that got out of line. I mean, what kind of medieval move is that? But even belt whippings didn't stop Kirk from getting into fights left, right and center. In fact, he got into so many scraps that he dropped out of eighth grade. I guess you could say that school wasn't really his thing. But don't worry, he had a backup plan. You see, Kirk's older brother was a professional boxer, and he taught Kirk how to defend himself like a pro. And boy, did Kirk take to boxing like a duck to water. He went on to have a rock solid amateur career with a record of 29 wins and only four losses. His boxing nickname was Rifle Right Kirkorian. But even with that impressive record, Kirk knew that he didn't have what it takes to make it as a pro. He just wasn't big enough or fast enough to compete with the naturally gifted athletes of that era. But you know what they say, when one door closes, another one opens. And that's exactly what happened. One day, he was installing furnaces with a buddy and his life changed forever. His friend dragged him to Alhambra airport during lunch break to take a quick flight on a Piper Cub airplane. And guess what? Kirk got a bird's eye view of the beautiful California landscape from the mountains all the way to the ocean. And that's when he got hooked on flying. The very next day, my man Kirk was back at the airport to take his first flying lesson. But hold on a second, aren't flying lessons expensive? Well, they are, and Kirk didn't have any cash to spare. So what did he do? He talked to this flying instructor who was kind enough to cut him a deal. This instructor owned both a flight school and a ranch, and she told Kirk that if he helped out on the ranch, she would teach him how to fly. I mean, what a score. Kirk must have thought he hit the jackpot. But let me tell you, working on a ranch is no joke. 
Kirk was milking cows and shoveling manure and he didn't care one bit. That seemed like a much better path than installing furnaces in the scorching California heat. After six months of hard work, Kirk got his commercial pilot's license and landed a job as a flight instructor. And you know what the best part is? Just as Kirk got his license, World War II was brewing in Europe. If he had waited any longer, he would have been drafted into the infantry to fight in the trenches. But instead, he got to teach as a flying instructor with the Army Air Corps, which was a much cushier job with very little risk. But you know what? Teaching bored the hell out of this guy and it didn't pay all that well. Kirk had a fire burning in his belly to make something bigger with his life. He had a chip on his shoulder from his rough childhood, so he sussed out this opportunity to fly as a civilian pilot for the British Royal Air Force. The mission would be to fly brand new bombers from Montreal to England. He was basically working on delivering the planes manufactured in Canadian factories. He wasn't actually participating in the combat himself. Kirk was in his mid-twenties and let me tell you, this gig paid really well. Like $20,000 a month kind of well, and that's in today's dollars. You might be asking, why did it pay so much? Well, these bombers were meant for battle in Europe, not for flying across the Atlantic. So when Kirk was flying these planes, he had two basic routes to choose from. The first route was to fly from Montreal to Labrador to Greenland to Iceland and then to England. Sounds good, right? He could refuel along the way, but there was a catch. This route was further north, which meant that ice would form on the wings of the planes and a lot of them would crash en route. Yikes! So Kirk had another option to fly directly from Montreal to England. But here's why that option was not great either. The plane didn't have a big enough fuel tank to last the full trip. So how did he make it work? Well, he had to catch this jet stream current that would pull the plane and have it go all the way on a single tank of fuel. Crazy, right? So here's the thing. That type of work was insanely dangerous. I'm talking statistically it was more dangerous than actual combat situations. Some historians even said that Kirk's chance of dying on each flight was about 3%. Can you believe that? That's like playing Russian roulette with a revolver that has one live bullet in a chamber with only 30 spaces. How crazy is that? And let me tell you, Kirk had lots of close calls. One time he was flying above the clouds and the plane was running out of fuel. So Kirk started getting ready to jump out of the airplane with a parachute. And his navigator was just yelling at him, telling him, hold up, hold up, let's drop below the clouds and see how close we are to land. And you won't believe what happened next. As soon as they got below the clouds and could actually see their surroundings, they saw the lights of the airport up ahead. And they ended up landing the plane just as it ran out of gas. Talk about a close call. Now, despite all the danger, Kirk delivered 33 airplanes, logged thousands of hours of flight time, traveled to four continents, and flew his first four-engine plane in just two and a half years with the Royal Air Force. And on top of all that, he saved most of his generous salary. What a legend. When Kirk was in his 30s and the war ended, he bought a little Cessna airplane for about 60,000 bucks. He started training other pilots and also running charter flights to fly gamblers from LA to Vegas. Driving to Vegas took about 10 hours round trip, but flying only took two. So of course, all the big spenders wanted to fly and Vegas was starting to become the entertainment capital of the world. Kirk was the mechanic, cleaner, salesperson, and the pilot for his little airline. So after two years of working his tail off, he ended up buying this other little company called the Los Angeles Air Service. It was a tiny airline with three planes, but that allowed him to start booking new types of charter flights to different destinations. Business was doing very well. Then the Korean War broke out, and he actually got some military contracts that gave his tiny business a big growth spurt. And let's take a step back here. Did Kirk have a great knack for business? Sure, but he was also lucky to be at the right place at the right time. During World War II, there was a bunch of technology developed to make airplanes and air transport better and safer. So by the time the war ended, this new technology was used for civilian purposes, and he was right smack dab in the middle of all of it. 
By the mid-50s, for the first time ever, more people in the US traveled by air than by train. By the late 50s, airliners replaced ocean liners as the preferred way to cross the Atlantic. So Kirk was right in the middle of this huge boom happening. He was always looking for ways to expand. So 12 years after starting his little airline, he bought a jet and became the first company to offer chartered jet flights. But jets were expensive and Kirk took on too much debt. He made the same mistake as his old man made with all those farms back in the day. So Kirk actually had to sell his business in the early 60s, but he was smart about it. He structured the deal so that he would retain a share of the airline's future earnings as part of the sales price. And wouldn't you know it, jet flights brought in record profits. And Kirk was able to buy back the entire company a few years later. He grew the business for some time, and then he sold the airline in the late 60s for around 700 million. So you can sort of get a sense that Kirk had this willingness to take on tons of risk with whatever he was doing. But he also loved gambling. During the war, he would play on tons of poker games at army bases. And one time when Kirk flew a customer to Vegas, they both got to gambling and they both lost all the money that they had brought with them in one night. The next morning, they got up and they only had $50 left between the two of them. The other guy wanted to save their last 50 bucks for breakfast. But Kirk said, ah, the hell with that. And he went back to the crabs table. Guess what? He ended up winning a few thousand bucks. Later on, as he kept on getting wealthier and wealthier, Kirk became well known as a high roller in Vegas, and he would often lose hundreds of thousands of dollars per night. Of course, this is the type of behavior that would make someone lose their fortune very quickly. Every game in Vegas has the odds in the casino's favor. If you play long enough, the casino is going to win all your money. So after losing a ton of money, Kirk realized that gambling is not a reliable way to get wealthy. So he used different strategies to deal with that. At first, he'd set specific limits on how much he would gamble. And then later on, he pretty much stopped gambling altogether. Now, Kirk was flying people to Vegas for nine years before he made his first investment in Sin City. And you know what? He really did his homework. He took time to understand the market and to figure out the risks involved. Vegas was going through a huge boom after the war ended. Gambling was legal and the city was growing massively. Just to give you an idea, the city population tripled in 10 years. And gambling wasn't the only attraction. By that time, there were huge stars performing in Vegas as well. You had guys like Sinatra and Bing Crosby. It was the place to be. Kirk was seeing this huge growth and he wanted a piece of the action. His first investment was around 500,000 for a share in the Dunes Hotel. Kirk had high hopes and that was a good amount of money, but unfortunately the hotel opened during a time when tourism was decreasing and a bunch of other hotels opened up within a six week period. So there were just too many rooms available to be profitable. Kirk's equity stake went to zero and he was crushed. He lost his whole investment, but he didn't give up. He learned his lesson and resolved never to invest in someone else's casino operation again. Lesson learned. Now that didn't stop him from looking into other opportunities in the city years later. Fast forward a few years, Kirk was 45 and still killing it in the aviation business. This guy was making bank. So taking some time to heal after his first failed Vegas investment, he bought 80 acres of land for about 8 million bucks. Land was vacant and it was right across from the famous Las Vegas Strip. But there was just one issue he had to overcome. The land he bought was separated from the Vegas Strip by a small, long parcel of property that was so small that you couldn't build anything on it. Most people would have taken a look at that and said, ah, screw it. But not a Kirk. Oh no. He worked out this deal where he traded five acres he owned for that tiny strip of land. It was a genius move because then he took this big parcel that he now owned and he leased it to Caesar's Palace. It was a great example of him figuring out value where others didn't really see the opportunity. Kirk collected 30 million bucks in rent from Caesar's before selling the land to them for another 40 million. This guy was raking it in. So now he had the cash from the airline and he had the real estate money as well. In the late 60s, Kirk bought another 82 acres on the strip. He had a plan to build this massive casino and hotel there. His vision was a huge 1500 room casino hotel combo, but he wasn't going to do it alone. 
Kirk knew that he needed to work with other experienced people, so he hired true casino experts to help him with his vision. But there was one huge roadblock, and it was all about how do you train the staff for this massive hotel? That's no small feat, my friends. So you won't believe the solution that they came up with. They came up with this plan of buying another hotel called the Flamingo just to train staff for this massive new international hotel that they plan to build. How crazy is that? And let me tell you, there were tons of doubts about Kirk's ability to fill all 1,500 rooms at the International. People thought it was impossible, but Kirk didn't give a damn. He rolled the dice and started up this new project. And his new casino team was able to poach over 30 executives from another casino hotel to work at Kirk's operation. This guy was always thinking outside the box. And sure, a lot of people were criticizing Kirk. They were saying that the hotel was too big and too far away from the main high foot traffic area. But he believed in his instincts and to make sure that they got huge media coverage, they actually ended up getting Barbara Streisand and Elvis as the first two performers in the main showroom. That made huge news and his hotel casino was the hottest spot in town. He had a huge winner on his hands. It only took a few years for him to get an amazing offer from Hilton Hotels for both his properties and Kirk sold. So even though he had a net worth of about 1.8 billion in the late 60s, there were lots of other people developing in Las Vegas. So how did Kirk get so rich? Well, he went on to build the biggest, baddest hotel casinos in Vegas not once, not twice, but three separate times. The MGM Grand Hotel and Theme Park had a whopping 5,000 rooms. I mean, that's some serious guts right there. If any one of those hotels didn't fill up to capacity, it would have been game over for Kirk's fortune. At this point, he could have easily retired, but he kept at the business because he loved the excitement of doing deals too much to give it up. He even ended up buying the MGM film studio as a sort of side quest. Now you'd think that a guy with that kind of cash would be living it up, right? Rubbing elbows with celebrities, going to the Oscars, since he owned a massive film studio, and that type of stuff, right? Well, that type of life was not for Kirk. He kept a low profile and stayed out of the spotlight. He'd watch the Oscars from the comfort of his own home like the rest of us. And get this, even when he went to the movies, he'd buy a regular ticket and sit in a crowded theater. This guy could have had his own private screenings, but nah, he wanted to be one with the people. And you know what? It worked. Most of his staff didn't even recognize him when he visited his own hotels. That's how anonymous this dude was. This guy was a business genius, but he couldn't quite nail down the whole marriage thing. I mean, he had four of them. Four! And let's just say they didn't all end happily ever after. His fourth marriage? Yeah, it didn't make it to the two-month mark. And don't even get me started on marriage number three. That divorce was so messy that they had to bring in a private investigator. And guess what? The PI got caught wiretapping Kirk's ex-wife's phone. What a disaster. I guess it just shows you that even the most successful people could struggle in certain areas of their lives. But hey, at least Kirk had his business game on point. And he didn't just have a hard time on the personal life front either. In the 80s, there was a massive fire that broke out at the MGM hotel that he owned. The fire started by this electrical issue in a refrigerated pastry display case. Tragically, 85 people died and hundreds were injured. That was a huge setback and Kirk felt the weight of all the lives that were lost. It was a huge catastrophe that was one of the worst hotel fires in US history. There was such outrage and shock about it that it helped change hotel fire safety laws in the US and internationally as well. And it also led to the expansion of the Las Vegas emergency services. That event really affected Kirk deep down. And even later in life, it was a tough thing for him to talk about. Now you'd think that someone with that much dough would have a massive ego and not care at all about what anybody else thought of him. But no, Kirk was different. Despite all his money and his huge achievements, he couldn't shake the fact that he left school early. And in one interview, he even admitted that he admired real estate guys like Donald Trump and Steve Wynn. Those guys were great at talking and charming people and Kirk knew that he was nowhere close to being as charismatic. That kind of bothered him on the inside. Now let's talk a little bit about how he handled his wealth. This man was very generous. He would tip waiters 100 bucks after a $10 meal. 
Now you might think that a guy that would splurge on a 190 foot yacht and a 737 jet for his own personal use would be throwing money left and right. But the thing is, he had an odd frugal side too. His personal office was so discreet that no one would ever guess that a billionaire was working there. And forget about flashy vehicles. This guy was known for driving regular cars around town. I'm talking about cars like a Pontiac Firebird, a Jeep Grand Cherokee, and a Ford Taurus. I mean, come on, this guy was a billionaire, and he loved driving the same cars that Bob from accounting could afford. Now let's take a look into how he dealt with making investments. In the 90s, he wanted to buy into some automakers, so he called up his investment advisor to his house. Kirk told him that he wanted to buy 22 million shares of Chrysler. And the advisor was like, Hold up, Kirk. Chrysler is not a good buy. They're number three in the automaker game, and they got tons of sketchy debts. The advisor even offered to have his research team look into Chrysler and come up with some good analysis for Kirk to use. But Kirk refused. He said no. Basically just made up his mind by doing his own research, and then he pulled the trigger on making this huge purchase. Two years later, Chrysler's value tripled. And Kirk didn't stop there. He did his own analysis when he was buying shares of GM and Ford as well. And this guy had a good sense for proper value opportunities. But let's not forget that he also had his fair share of tough times. During the global financial crisis, Kirk had a difficult situation and he ended up having to exit his auto industry positions in late 2008, just as it was heading for its worst slump since the Great Depression. And man, did he get burned pretty bad through all of that. His $18 billion net worth in 2007 put him at number 7 on the Forbes 400 list. But by 2009, he fell to 97th and his net worth shrunk to only $3 billion. He died in 2015 at the age of 98, leaving behind a legacy as one of the most successful and influential investors. And he's also donated tons of money to charity along the way. All right, Vision Nation, that wraps it up for this episode. If you've enjoyed it, you can check out our last episode right here. It's about a regular guy who made $750 million by selling canned water. The story blew my mind. Like, how can you compete with the Coca-Colas of the world and get your startup to be that valuable? Crazy stuff. Also, if you're a new listener, please smash that like button and hit the subscribe button because you don't want to miss out on our next episode. Thank you and I hope you have an amazing day.